with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Cindy Toth. She's the Director of Environmental Policy at the Town of Oakville, and she's going to say a few words. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'll just give a brief introduction. Uh, while coyotes are commonly found in Oakville and most other urban areas, even downtown Toronto, they generally keep a low profile. So most people aren't aware that they exist so close by. In fact, in the past, Bronte Provincial Park has held coyote howls as part of their New Year's Eve events, just so participants can try and catch a glimpse of and hear a coyote, something somewhat uh, considered somewhat rare or exotic as part of their New Year's Eve celebrations. Recently, however, there have been frequent reports of sightings around town, particularly in the Glen Abbey area. This has raised concerns in the minds of many, many residents. Our speakers tonight will provide factual information based on experience and research, and they will be able to answer your questions. Tonight's presentation is also part of a larger initiative in June, Council approved the Oakville Wildlife Strategy and Conflict Guidelines. These provide better clarity and direction for staff, service providers, and the community for support supporting biodiversity and minimizing wildlife conflict situations. A key part of this strategy is education. When we have a better understanding of the amazing benefits that we have here in Oakville with our numerous green spaces, and resident wild neighbors, and when we understand how to better prevent conflict situations, we all benefit. To provide this education, we are hosting a speaker series on various topics of interest to residents. We are starting with tonight's event focused on coyotes. Three future events are planned for 2012, including living with Canada geese, wildlife, wildlife proofing your home, and backyard neighbors. We'll be posting more information on these on the town's website once dates for these events are uh, set. Moving on to tonight's presentation, the town is pleased to offer presentations on living with coyotes, featuring guest speakers Michael Howie and Natalie um, Carvonen. We gr regret that the original speaker, John Pasapio, from a biologist with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, when, was then able to speak tonight, but Natalie has an extensive knowledge to share with us. We are asking that you hold off on asking questions until both the end of both presentations. At that time, we'll ask you for your questions and answers will be provided by our guest speakers and staff from the town's parks and open space and environmental policy departments and the Oakville and Milton Humane Society. The question and answer session will be modified by Jim and uh, who will make sure everybody gets an equal chance to speak and that the questions are derided to the right person for answering. We hope you enjoy tonight's presentation and we're looking forward to an informative evening. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jim who will introduce our first speakers. Thank you, Cindy. And we'll get going with the presentation. So uh, the first presentation is from Michael Howey. He's a, re a reporter with Oakville Today and he's going to talk about media and coyotes. Uh, so my name is Michael Howie. As Sue has said, I'm a reporter with North Oakville Today newspaper. I've covered a great deal of coyote issues and stories, and I spent a great deal of time researching them. Tonight I'm going to talk with you a bit about uh, understanding media sensationalism. I'm going to start with asking a question. Is the media a reliable source of information? Journalists spend hours going over research, interviewing experts, and fact-checking before they file a story. What shows up in the newspaper is supposed to be the truth. But sometimes, things aren't that simple. In one local story, the headline was, Coyote Attacks Dog. The journalist interviewed the owner of the dog and saw some comments from the Humane Society. The article, frankly, was scary. There were quotes about aggression, people being killed, and the safety of children. It ran on the first few pages of the paper and was shared frequently online. And it was wrong. Well, that's not quite right. It wasn't wrong. It just wasn't quite right. The story was based entirely on the statements of a rightfully frightened woman who believed her dog was viciously attacked and barely made an escape. The headline for another story was, Coyote Attack, Not What It Seemed. 
Experts on canine behavior were consulted, and it was explained the incident was not, in fact, an attack. It was shared that only two people in recorded history have been killed by coyotes, and it was also shared that there has been no physical contact between humans and coyotes in Oakville in recent years. But that story was not as popular. Why? Because the first headline scares you. The second does not. Fear is one of the base emotions in all animals, including humans. Fear causes alterations to our physiology. Fear is instinctual and loud. It does not require critical thinking or analysis. It requires action. Consider this. The media has the power of fear in their pockets. Every day, we make choices in which words to use. Our goal, particularly with headlines, is to grab attention and keep your eyes on the page. Fear will do this. Immediate threat makes you pay attention. Something interesting you should probably know more about does not. Only a few days ago, the October edition of Canadian Living came out, and in it was a coyote story that could keep you out of the forest for good. An Oakville resident told a truly harrowing story of her encounter with coyotes. While walking her two dogs in Brawny Creek, one of them ran ahead. Moments later, she heard yelping and snarling and dashed forward. Her other dog went with her. She found her pet locked in combat on its hind legs with a coyote. Her other dog bravely ran forward and broke up the conflict, probably saving his life. But just a few moments later, she looked up and four more coyotes appeared on the crest of a nearby hill. They surrounded her and it took several minutes for her to be able to make an escape. In the end, she thanked her dogs for saving her life. It was something Jack London would have been proud of. Stories like this occur across Canada and the United States when it comes to coyotes. The fear felt by the individuals and written about by many talented reporters transcends the page. A psychotherapist told me that visualization is so powerful your brain can actually begin triggering a fear response just by reading one of these stories. So let's stop and break down the Canadian living story to just the facts. The woman was walking her two dogs off leash in a forest. It was early winter, just before sunrise. While out of her sight, her dog got in a scuffle with a coyote. I say scuffle and not a fight or attack because neither the dog nor the coyote was hurt. The other coyotes in the group stood and watched her and her dogs until they left the area. That seems somewhat less scary because it's just the facts. In journalism, we know how to scare you and we'll use it. Dr. Shelley Alexander at the University of Calgary conducted a study to show how powerful this can be. Using over 200 media articles in relation to urban coyotes, she compiled lists of the descriptors used by the media when humans kill coyotes and when coyotes attack pets. Shot and killed, culled, killed, euthanized, removed, and put down were common when the media noted the deaths of coyotes at human hands. These words and phrases are simple, fact-based explanations. But when describing a coyote attacking a pet, the media used phrases such as marauding, brazen attacks, guts hanging out, necks ripped open, ribs picked clean, an unreported plague, and brutal. These words and phrases are highly visual, emotionally charged, and offer very little in terms of fact and information. Applying the same style of writing to humans killing coyotes, one could say, ripped flesh apart with bullets, destroyed the coyote family, torn from their territory, assassinated or terrorized. As I said earlier, none of these words are wrong. They're just not exactly right. A good example of this occurred over summer when a man and his wife stumbled upon a grizzly and her cubs in Yellowstone Park. The mother bear did what mother bears will do and protected her cubs. As a result, the male hiker died. Two online news sources headlined their stories with as much factual information as possible. <clears throat> the rest did not. While the media certainly will not stop sensationalizing anytime soon, 
media consumers can learn to read past it. There are three key components you'll come across in most news articles. The facts, the angle, and the commentary. The facts are simple and clear cut. They should not have any tone, editorializing, or opinion related to them. The angle is what connects the facts. While journalists are meant to be unbiased and nonpartisan, they aren't. If you have to draw a line from A to B, there will be a wobble here and there. The same is true in writing. Commentary is the hardest part because of how it's presented. There's traditional newspaper editorials on a clearly defined opinion page. But then there's columns, which sometimes blur the lines between opinion and facts. There's quotes from people who are pushing an agenda. There's online comments that sometimes aren't clearly separated from the news. It can get quite confusing quite quickly. If you're trying to identify sensationalism, try to locate the basic facts and separate them from the other parts of the story. When it comes to radio and television, keep in mind that a 30-second spot is rarely ever enough for a truly balanced story. Since the internet became accessible to the public in the early 90s, the face of research has changed, making what was once an academic exercise simple for anyone with a computer. But Alexander Pope noted the fatal flaw with the internet over 300 years ago. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. An example of this can be found in the reports of the killing of Toronto folk singer Taylor Mitchell by coyotes in Nova Scotia in 2009. The story is quite simple. The singer was walking through an area known to be home to coyotes. She was found, clearly attacked by the still nearby coyotes, and died overnight in a hospital. A hunt for the coyotes involved began, as well as a subsequent bounty which resulted in over 100 coyote deaths in a one-year period. Also available online in search engines are in-depth studies, references to texts, and analysis of coyotes and their behavior as they relate to this incident. Now, when you read about this online, you're going to come across news articles that also contain all kinds of guesswork, speculation, and slants. Between the two groups, the news reports and the research, guess which comes up on Google first? In my newsroom, I have instilled an important adage. I'd rather have it right than have it first. Unfortunately, this is not the case in most media outlets, nor do they have a luxury of a full week between editions to research. I have spent literally hundreds of hours reading studies, textbooks, tables and statistics, as well as interviewing internationally renowned experts. Some people have said I'm pro-coyote, but that's not accurate. I'm pro-education. Like I said earlier, every journalist takes facts and retells them, and every journalist has an angle. Some use an angle that causes fear and anxiety. I try to use an angle that educates. Where most media sources show only the human side of the equation, I try to show both sides of it. When I write, I talk about the people, but I also talk about the animal, in fact-based terms. In the end, it may look like I'm pro-coyote, but really, I'm not. I'm just pro-information. Not glory, not glamour, not blood and gore, just information. I'm not always on target, but that's what I aim for, because that's my job. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for kickstarting the presentations. Next, we have Natalie Carvonen. She is a biologist who has worked in wildlife rehabilitation for about 24 years. In 1992, Natalie started the Toronto Wildlife Centre, which still runs today, so your 20th anniversary is next year. Wow. The Toronto Wildlife Centre is now the busiest wildlife centre in Canada, admitting up to 5,000 sick, injured, and orphaned wildlife, wild animals every year. In addition, the wildlife rehabilitation program that they run, they have a veterinary hospital, a wildlife rescue program, and the Toronto Wildlife Centre runs a busy wildlife hotline and public education program. So without further ado, Natalie, we'll turn it over to you. Let's get all organized here. 
Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for uh, letting me come and speak with you this evening. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, because I don't see a clock in this room, I'm going to have to go over there to check either my phone or that computer for the time once in a while, make sure I'm still on track. Uh, also, um, I was a very last minute substitution and uh, I quickly cobbled together um, some Coyote presentations that I had. Uh, so there may be a little bit of a repetition here and there, but I think that that's not necessarily a bad thing. So just so you know, I, I slid in there about 36 hours ago to get re ready for this presentation. So uh, I'll just start off by telling you just a little bit about uh, Toronto Wildlife Centre. Uh, since you don't have a wildlife centre here at Oakville, and we actually do uh, a lot of work for the wild animals here in Oakville, helping you as much as we possibly can. Um, uh, as was mentioned, uh, we're now the busiest wildlife centre in Canada. That was never our goal, uh, but it's simply because the GTA is such a busy area with humans and wildlife and all kinds of conflict situations. We are a charity, so we run entirely on donations. And uh, a few of our core programs, uh, I'll just mention very briefly with these slides here. Uh, our wildlife hotline is one of our flagship programs. We do get about 30,000 phone calls a year through our hotline, and that's actually because that's all we can handle. Um, if we just threw open the floodgates and took every single phone call that um, came our way, we'd probably be taking 50, 60, 70,000 calls a year. So we're always trying to raise more funds to, to get more trained staff had to handle more calls because uh, it's, it's amazing um, the amount of questions that are out there and the lack of information that there is for people when they need help with situations. Uh, different ways that our hotline helps, of course, we assess calls about sick, injured and orphaned wild animals. And orphaned, uh, I usually would put in quotation marks because about 50% of the calls we get about so-called orphans are not orphans at all. They're babies where people just simply don't realize that they're in a normal situation or can be returned to their parents. Um, we help uh, with resolving nuisance situations um, when people are, are frustrated or uh, perplexed by a situation they're having with a wild animal. We help by simply providing um, general information, like when people see an opossum in their backyard for the first time, think it's a giant sewer rat, they freak out and they have no idea what it is. Um, just calm people down by giving them realistic information about the animals in their neighborhood. And then our hotline also um, assesses and coordinates our rescue program as well, making sure that our rescue staff are not racing out to get things like uh, plastic owls off roofs and uh, all the different types of calls we get from people who are frantic about situations that they, they think may be more desperate than they really are. Uh, so our wildlife rescue program uh, is uh, just purely a rescue program. We don't have a pickup service. Again, wish we had the resources for that, but our rescue staff are out there doing things that members of the public can't do. Um, they're dealing with dangerous situations or dangerous animals. Um, they have training like Andrew here in, uh, in ice water rescues. They have training in swift water rescues. They have training in, in rappelling up and down the sides of cliffs and climbing trees and chemical, mobiliza um, chemical immobilization. And, uh, and all manner of things that we, we can't typically ask uh, a member of the public to do. Um, we can ask a member of the public, you know, if you find a baby squirrel, can you put it in a box and give it a, a warm water bottle and bring it into a local rehabilitator? But in this case, um, let me see if this laser pointer works. Over here, uh, covered by this blanket, is actually a swan um, that was flash frozen into the ice. And our rescue staff had to actually go out in the icy water and chip this swan out of the ice, this happens more than you would think, and actually um, bring it into safety and bring it into our hospital. That's not something we can typically just ask any old person to do. We don't get out there on the ice and do that. <clears throat> Uh, as part of our uh, wildlife rescue program, we do have an oil spill response program uh, and oiled animals show up more often than you would think uh, in the GTA. So we, we do a fair bit of work with uh, industrial accidents and uh, small spills involving anywhere from a couple dozen to a couple hundred uh, birds, beavers, um, minks, muskrats, turtles, uh, frogs, anything that lives in or near water. In our wildlife rehabilitation program, um, I, as I, I was mentioned before, we, we get about 5,000 animals a year, again, because that's all we can handle, uh, including a number of animals from Oakville. Um, we do work with over 270 different species of wildlife, um, including rare, threatened, endangered species, and including coyotes. Our veterinary hospital is, is quite unique in that our veterinarians are very specialized in wildlife medicine. Um, we have uh, two part-time veterinarians on staff. Um, we have volunteer vets who work with us, but they tend to just be specialists. Um, not your average dog and cat vet, you know, bless their hearts, but they, they don't know what to do with a frog with nose fungus or a bat with neurological problems in his left wing because they just don't see those kinds of animals. So um, our volunteer vets tend to be things like veterinary dentist, um, a uh, veterinary ophthalmologist, we basically bring him eyes, happens to be in a turtle or a porcupine or whatever the animal happens to be. 
So um, just I'll talk just generally about wildlife before I talk more specifically about coyotes. Um, some of the threats generally to urban wildlife uh, in uh, our cities are certainly cars is one of the things that we, we think of first as being a very big threat. And down here, these are actually two little Canada goslings um, who somehow made them way, their way on the inside median of this busy highway. Um, certainly cats and dogs are uh, an enormous threat to um, a lot of wild animals. Um, Dogs, for example, probably many of you are aware, are amazingly good at smelling things out. Um, deer fawns or cottontail rabbits, where their mothers are very good at stashing them away and camouflaging them from uh, normal, uh, normal, from wild predators, um, are found by dogs a lot and, uh, and sometimes injured quite badly by dogs. And then, of course, cats, um, I'll talk about a little bit later, actually, it's a much bigger issue. Um, glass buildings and residential windows are certainly big threats to wildlife. Uh, the worst year for us so far, we've admitted 1,600 birds during spring and fall migration that hit uh, glass buildings. And, uh, and that's just in a very small little geographic area. This is a, a really big problem in North America as a whole. And we're building more glass buildings everywhere I look, so it's, um, it's a big challenge to our migratory birds. <clears throat> Other examples, things you might not think of, green roofs. Um, every duck and goose needs to receive a memo that a green roof is not a place to nest. Uh, because as wonderful as they are, you know, for plants and aesthetically, uh, we get a bazillion phone calls every springtime where the duck family has, she's laid her eggs, she's incubated her eggs, and now all the babies have hatched, now they're lined up 14 stories up on the roof of a building looking down at the concrete. And they can't get off that building. And I don't think their little duck brains have figured that part out yet. Um, so they, I guess they see this green patch from the sky and they come down, they land there, they nest there, and it actually, um, it's a pretty big threat. So a lot of them are captured and taken off the roof by uh, our rescue staff. It's no small feat to catch a mother duck that can still fly. Um, but some of them don't make it. They just plummet right off the building down to the concrete. So that's a, definitely a new threat for wildlife. Hydro lines um, are a very big threat to birds, uh, almost as, as much as glass buildings, actually. Uh, fishing line and kite string are a huge threat, uh, especially to birds, uh, in a lot of different circumstances. Uh, environmental toxins certainly uh, are an enormous threat, which I, I won't get into too much, because I'm just glossing over these. And then uh, trapping and relocating are especially an enormous threat um, for babies. Um, Many of you, or, or some of you, may be aware that trapping and relocating is actually not legal, uh, according to the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act. Um, but there are lots and lots of companies out there that are still doing it. There are lots of individual members of the public uh, who are doing it, not realizing the implications of what they are doing. And usually, if you hear something bumping around in your attic or in your shed, uh, it's usually in the spring and summer, and it's usually a mother uh, that has babies. And so when these mothers are, are driven away to a nice little field somewhere with uh, butterflies and wildflowers and let go, uh, those babies are left behind and orphaned just in huge, huge numbers. So um, that's certainly a, a threat to urban wildlife too, um, because that practice goes on a lot. And certainly just plain out cruelty to animals uh, is a big, very big threat to urban wildlife. We had admitted an opossum the other day in good body condition. It was uh, on a road, kind of like a drunken sailor. We didn't know um, exactly what was wrong with him at first. He just seemed really out of it. I took x-rays and he had uh, eight uh, pellets from a BB gun in his head. And that's not an accident. Or one might be an accident, but not eight. Uh, so that kind of thing happens more often than you might think. Certainly factors resulting in nuisance situations with wild animals, just structural weaknesses in our buildings, under our sheds, uh, you know, in our, uh, under our decks, uh, anywhere on our property that uh, might be a place that an animal might consider a good home. Um, attractants around our homes and workplaces. So food, of course, is a huge one, uh, but it may be places like shelter or, or fresh water, places to hide could be an attractant. Um, An intentional, intentional feeding of wildlife um, certainly is something that results in, in a lot of nuisance situations. And uh, <clears throat> this is something that I'll definitely touch on uh, several times in uh, my presentation. Um, but there's all kinds of campaigns going uh, on out there saying, you know, a fed, a fed coyote is a dead coyote, a fed bear is a dead bear. Um, Feeding of wild animals dramatically changes their behavior. And it is something, I, I can't even stop my husband from doing it sometimes. I'm like, no, don't do that. And he actually volunteers for uh, Toronto Wildlife Center too. He has for about nine years. But I think it's just this instinctive need in a, lot of, in a lot of us that you must 
give it some food if you see it, you know, give it some bread if you see it in the park, or, or give it something if you see it down, you know, by the water. And, uh, and for some people, it's actually, it's a real hobby, you know, it's, it, you know, they're down there every single day, um, you know, with some people, there's a, there's a woman in Rosedale that I know, she's got a dinner bell outside her mansion, and uh, she goes out there every day, rings the dinner bell, and puts a 25 kilogram bag of dog food out on her driveway, and all the raccoons from the Rosedale Ravine come running up and eat under her driveway. And she's trained them. You know, they hear that dinner bell, they're like, yay, it's dinner time, and they come running up. And she loves it. She started doing that when her son was um, very small, now he's grown up and moved away. Um, but it's a huge hobby, and, and as I mentioned, our hotline gets through 30,000 calls a year. I bet you if, I, uh, if we asked that question of all of them, half of them would be feeding wild animals. Um, so it does cause a lot of problem. Um, there was one lady I remember who said that she had spent the last three months training a raccoon to A, open the door to her kitchen and come in, and B, take a cracker from her mouth. Um, now, the next call that we might get might be somebody saying, why is this raccoon on the screen of my kitchen door? You know, why is this raccoon hanging around my house all the time? And those two things are probably not unrelated. You know, if you have a ton of people feeding wild animals and essentially training them, you know, to come to people, to come to houses, to come to decks, come around, you know, then the other half of the people are saying, what is going on? You know, they're, might, maybe they're frightened of those animals. You know, maybe they think that the animal has rabies. You know, they, something uh, is strange because they haven't been feeding it. So they don't understand why the behavior has changed. <clears throat> Lack of uh, information and misinformation certainly results in, in a lot of uh, nuisance situations where people just don't understand um, the situation. So snakes, poor little buggers. Um, people just don't know anything about snakes um, in southern Ontario and to them they see this as a nuisance situation simply because they, they don't know anything about, about snakes. They don't understand that we don't have any dangerous snakes. Um, they'll call our hotline shrieking because there's a garter snake in the backyard. They've got the kids inside, the doors, the doors and windows are boarded up and you know they're calling from behind the couch with their cell phone and they're, they're just terrified and it's it's not a nuisance situation, really. You know, it's annoying them, for sure, but it's just simply because um, they don't know enough about the animal or the situation. Certainly there's um, habitats that uh, act as attractants for wild animals um, that, that we create. Uh, for example, pigeons uh, in the wild would normally roost on cliff ledges. Uh, in cities, what looks like a cliff ledge? An apartment building with balconies sticking out maybe or you know window air conditioners sticking out of windows you know those are in their little pigeon brains they don't see any cliffs with cliff ledges around you know Oakville or Toronto um, what they see are these structures that have the same you know they're tall you know they have the same kind of setup and they're like all right this is close enough to a cliff ledge um, so I mean we're essentially creating our own problems because I mean for the, those wild animals are always frustrated about Canada geese why are there so many Canada geese in our parks well, Canada geese love Kentucky bluegrass, which we won't stop planting. Um, they love it when it's mowed right down and always growing new shoots. They love having big open expanses, which is how we design all of our parks. They love having easy access to water. We don't put any barrier plantings around our ponds in the parks because we want to be able to, you know, splash in the water. I mean, those things are understandable. Um, but it's like textbook perfect goose habitat. If you, you just need to put out a neon sign saying perfect goose habitat here, and, uh, you know, that is exactly what they need. And there's lots of information out there about that. Um, we know that that's perfect goose habitat. We keep making it. So um, I find that kind of odd. But, I mean, we're just creating our own nuisance situations there. And then certainly with wild animals, um, there's many wild animals that are just trying to do what's normal for them that's creating a nuisance situation. Beavers uh, chopping down trees. Oh, my gosh. Uh, or things like uh, robins, if you've ever had a robin nesting very close to your house, some of them like nesting on the, the lights by the front porches, for example. Um, they will aggressively defend their uh, territory because they're terrified that you're going to hurt their babies. That's normal for them. That's something that they would normally do in the wild if any predator came by, and we're the predator that happens to be coming by their nesting area. So um, these are all things that sort of result in um, nuisance situations with wild animals in our communities. So I want to talk a little bit about our friend the coyote now. Um, we do work with uh, a lot of coyotes at Toronto Wildlife Centre. We, we work with sick, injured and orphan coyotes. We work um, with a lot of rescue situations with coyotes and we get a lot of phone calls um, about coyotes. And a lot of the times after there's been things in the media about coyotes. And I actually really appreciated Michael's presentation. Um, we get a lot of uh, phone calls from reporters at Toronto Wildlife Centre about all manner of wildlife situations. And, and I have learned over the years 
to ask almost right off the bat, what's the gist of your story exactly? <laughs> and there are definitely some reporters, I got a little list going in my computer that I actually won't do stories with them anymore, or their, their publication, um, because we have had some pretty bad experiences similar to um, what was being described. I did a story some years back um, with a major magazine that I thought was credible um, about raccoons, and uh, what came out was a front page close-up of a raccoon face with big red bold letters over it saying, Invasion. I'm like, oh, that's awesome that my name's all over that article. <laughs> I love that. So I just recently got a call from that reporter again, and he was pretty annoyed that I would not do a story with him again for that particular magazine. So uh, this was uh, historically the Coyote Range, this small area here. And this really big area here is uh, our current coyote range in North America. Um, certainly they're incredibly adoptable animals and um, much of the range that they're in now was formerly occupied by wolves. Um, coyotes and wolves don't get along very well together. Wolves are definitely the big bruisers of the canid world and they don't happily allow you know, smaller predators to hang around eating all their food. Um, so when there were uh, wolves in our area here, uh, there were very few coyotes in our area, but now that we've pushed all the wolves north, um, coyotes are like, yay, the wolves are gone, and now I can occupy this habitat. <clears throat> so just a little bit about the life history, um, and I'm not sure how much of this you may be aware of, but they just breed once a year, um, breeding in February, usually born uh, in about April or May. Average litter size, about six. Um, both parents are, are very, very involved in the rearing of the young. They're, they're both uh, very, very good parents, uh, involved right from day one, right through to the, when the young ones disperse, they stay together as a family group. Um, but only a small percentage of them actually survive. So only, um, possibly only 50% of the young ones will survive their first year. <clears throat> Basic social organization for coyotes is usually you will have uh, a mated pair moving together. Um, sometimes you'll have groups that form, uh, this would more, usually it would happen in the winter time and it would usually be for hunting purposes to take down uh, slightly larger animals. Um, they're very, very uh, smart at their hunting strategy and uh, they, they can um, strategize, you know, if you will, to take down, say, a weak, weak or debilitated deer or an animal like that that may be too much for just one or two coyotes by themselves. And most of the times, though, when we get calls about packs uh, of coyotes, it's a family group of coyotes that's still together, say, uh, in the fall, um, where it's actually just the young ones that are almost as big as the adults that are traveling uh, with the adults at that time. Coyotes also have an amazing ability to sound like a lot more animals than they really are. If you have just you know, three, four, five coyotes and they start all howling away in unison and communicating with each other. Um, a lot of times people report, and I've heard it myself too, that it sounds like 15 or, or 20 coyotes even. It's amazing the way their vocalizations can sound like that. <clears throat> and so this vocalization that they're doing is basically they're communicating uh, with each other uh, as a, a family group or they're communicating to others in the area about uh, their particular territory. So some of the uh, food habits of uh, coyotes, I mean, like all of us, uh, including us humans, um, we will often do what's easiest, and coyotes will as well. Their um, feeding behaviors will change somewhat according to the seasons. They will eat an average of one kilogram um, per day uh, of food. They'll typically feed, again, on what's easiest, things like small mammals, and birds, um, little things that they find around. They are omnivorous like dogs, so they will eat things like fruit and berries and eggs, even earthworms sometimes, fish occasionally. Um, they will sometimes, as I mentioned, take deer, like deer fawns or debilitated adults, or occasionally in the wintertime adults that have difficulty getting away because of heavy uh, or deep snow. Um, coyotes are very, very important uh, to our ecosystems uh, because they do control uh, a lot of rodents that we would, um, otherwise we would potentially have problems with uh, were it not for coyotes and other predators. So just uh, because this is often a very hot topic with coyotes, um, I think it's just very important to think about coyotes and the types of things that they normally um, hunt for and feed upon. And, and so these would be examples of normal food items for them. This would be, this is a, a gray squirrel. This is a rabbit. Um, and this would be pretty standard fare uh, for a coyote. But a coyote doesn't understand the difference uh, between a dog, a rabbit, a cat, and a groundhog 
who are all the same size. Um, this is something that, speaking on behalf of the coyote, uh, I don't think that the, if a coyote goes after a pet, he's not doing so to be mean. Um, he just simply doesn't understand that it's okay to eat this guy, but it's not okay to eat Fluffy, uh, who's outside, and probably a lot easier to catch. Um, but certainly, you know, for a coyote, you know, cats and small dogs are the exact same size as food items that they would typically eat 365 days a year. A little bit about cats going outdoors, though, uh, if I may segue for a moment, because this is definitely an issue that uh, is very close to my heart. Uh, I have a pet cat. I love my cat to death. I'm one of those crazy cat mothers that if my cat gets sick, I'll spend every penny I have trying to get them healthy. They'll be in the emergency clinic. I'll fly in vets from Sweden. My last cat that was sick had a little blood transfusion. They have little bags of cat blood in emergency clinics, and he had a little blood transfusion to make him better. And, but my cat is an indoor cat because I love my cat much too much for her to be outdoors and um, subject to predation by uh, all the predators are out there, but also more importantly, or from the cat's perspective anyways, uh, cars. I mean, cars are a really, really huge issue for cats that are wandering around outside. Um, so it's pretty dangerous uh, for cats to be outdoors just for their own well-being. Certainly, um, the majority of veterinarians do recommend that for their own safety that cats actually stay indoors. Um, there isn't up-to-date statistics in Toronto last time I checked, but in 2008, 2009, and sorry, I wasn't, didn't have time to check for Oakville, but uh, 3,265 uh, dead cats were picked up uh, in the city of Toronto. That's a lot of dead cats um, lying out there on the roads. Uh, lifespan of an outdoor cat is 10 years less, and again, I love my cat, and I'd like to keep her around, so that's why she's staying inside with her cat castle and her catnip and all of her silly cat toys. Um, dangerous to cats going outdoors, uh, certainly, you know, cars, disease, parasites, predation by animals, coyotes among them, uh, but also birds of prey will take cats as well. They get in fights with other animals, and there's certainly human cruelty issues, and a lot of cats get displaced as well. And this is a, a subject that um, I find really curious because 20, 30 years ago, we had a very dis different perspective on dogs. There were dogs running around, you know, all over the place on our streets and, you know, there wasn't a lot of control of dogs. And nowadays, if you see a dog by, by itself, you look around and go, where's the owner for that little cocker spaniel? Like, how could it be out here by itself? And, and we, we think, rightly so, that that, you know, dog should be, you know, under someone's care and control, you know, for the, for the safety of that dog. Um, but we haven't quite gotten there with cats yet, and it's, it's our, really our only pet that we still um, sort of have that perspective about. Um, so, I mean, when cats go outdoors and, uh, and coyotes um, do eat cats, and cats eat birds, and cats eat baby rabbits, and there's this whole kind of unbalanced ecosystem going on, um, often a lot of people get furious at the coyotes um, for going after the cat. But think for a moment. If we had other pets going outdoors, like if, if we let our hamsters run around all day long while we were at work, and a hawk came along and ate the hamster, you know, would we all say, the hawks all must be killed? You know, the hamster was just doing what's normal, he was out there wandering around the yard, and a hawk came down and got him, and so therefore, something must be done about the hawks. Um, I would venture to say that someone would come along and say, what the heck was your hamster doing outside by itself? You know, why wasn't the hamster inside where it was safe? But we don't think that way about cats yet. As far as danger to people goes uh, with uh, coyotes, I mean, certainly I think that perspective is, is very, very important with coyotes. Um, approximately 2,900 people are killed uh, on, our, on roads in Canada each year, yet we still drive every day in our cars. Um, people, almost 200 people a year are killed by lightning. Uh, there's uh, at least one or two deaths each year uh, from dogs, yet you know, we, we love our dogs, we have dogs in our communities, we're not terribly worried if our kids are around dogs. And my understanding was that there had only been one death, but um, Michael, you may know of a second one, maybe the gentleman in BC, perhaps? Anyways, we can talk about, chat about that later, but one or two deaths in the history of Canada um, from coyotes. Um, so it can happen, um, just like, you know, with a dangerous dog or, or you know, there, there can be situations where this happens, but it's extremely, extremely rare uh, for a coyote to injure a person at all um, or certainly kill a, coy kill a coyote, I'm sorry, kill a person. It's something that's uh, extremely aberrant behavior for them and shouldn't be something that you should uh, expect from your typical coyote that you see in your neighborhoods. Uh, in fact, in Toronto, not far from where our center is, there was um, a situation four years ago, I believe, 
where in one of our local parks there were um, there were rumors of a coyote that was actually nipping people on the ankle, which was weird. Um, and this coyote would run up to people and nip it on the ankle, nip them on the ankle, and then run away again. And, uh, and we actually supported our local animal control in capturing and euthanizing that animal because it is bizarre behavior. They just don't do that. And typically in situations like that, you will discover um, upon probing around that there was probably some interaction with people. That animal was probably being fed um, by people so that it was just running up and saying, you know, hey, feed me, you know, I'm here. Um, or, or something that's out of the ordinary, certainly for their behavior. Um, in the case of, of Taylor's death in 2009, um, we actually uh, knew her a little bit and, and we knew her, um, we know uh, her mother quite well. Uh, it's an amazing family. Um, I gotta say, they're all huge animal lovers. Um, believe it or not, her mother actually directed uh, donations uh, in, uh, in memorial of, of Taylor when she um, was unfortunately uh, killed. Uh, to Toronto Wildlife Center um, because uh, they all loved wildlife so much. Uh, they are not uh, angry about at the coyotes or about the situation. Uh, and in fact, um, Taylor's mother has done a lot of probing and, and has discovered that there was a farmer nearby that did raise and release two coyotes uh, in his barn. And uh, it is thought by a lot of people in the area that, that those are the coyotes um, that actually uh, ended up injuring and, and killing her daughter. So certainly a tragic situation, but an extremely, extremely rare occurrence. Uh, <clears throat> so again, just, to, just important to keep things in perspective. Um, a little bit just about general urban behavior of coyotes. Um, they're very well adapted to live both in rural, um, urban, and suburban areas. Um, they do, however, live generally in or near wildlife corridors. Um, so that means that they're usually in or near either ravine systems, um, hydro right-of-ways, or railroad track lands. And almost without exception, if there's a coyote being uh, seen frequently in a particular area, um, it's going to be very close to one of those types of corridors. <clears throat> they're typically active um, during the evening to uh, avoid human activity and to hunt. <clears throat> coyotes that are active during the daytime, though, are typically active because they've essentially gotten rewarded for being active during the daytime, so they're actually being fed by someone or they're actually finding food in a particular spot in the daytime, so they have, in essence, been trained uh, to be out during the day because they get fed. I'm just going to do a... Okay, I should really get a watch. <laughs> If we have so many clocks around the Wildlife Center, every room has a clock that I, I don't need to watch when I'm at work. Um, so coyotes have been persecuted um, by man for a very long time in North America. Um, there have been uh, varying degrees of either coyote problems or perceived coyote problems or sometimes created coyote problems um, for as long as there have been coyotes and man in North America. <clears throat> We've, uh, we've tried many, many, many things um, to, to get rid of them, uh, to stop them from doing what we don't like them doing, and it generally uh, it doesn't work very well to try to get rid of coyotes from an area. Um, we have tried uh, poisoning, we've tried trapping, we've tried shooting. There, there were also these um, horrible things, I forget the names of them, but they were uh, baited with meat, and when the coyote would bite them, it would blow up in their face, and it would blow the coyote's heads off. And that was really awful. Um, right now, even still, there are uh, approximately 500,000 coyotes a year killed in the United States. And yet their pop population is still stable and I think growing, <laughs> actually. Um, so uh, that doesn't seem to be an effective method of controlling uh, problems in areas. <clears throat> In many areas with coyotes, if you eradicate a particular group of coyotes, um, the remaining ones will actually have larger litter sizes the following year. And that's just not uh, coyotes. That, that works pretty much for all wild animals. Um, if you have enough food in an, in an area to support X amount of, of coyotes or whatever the animal is, and then half of those ones are removed, the ones that are left behind now will have double the amount of babies to basically fill uh, that ecological niche back in again and bring things up to the balance um, that the, the food supply will sustain. <clears throat> so uh, basically, at the end of the day, what is most important is just simply to learn as much as we possibly can about the, the problem or what it is that's bothering us about what the coyote is doing or what we're afraid of that the coyote might do. 
um, and then work to resolve that problem once we've educated ourselves as much as we possibly can. Um, generally, the, the knee-jerk reactions like trapping coyotes or, or killing uh, coyotes is something that is, is not going to work in pretty much any situation that I can ever think of. So just a, a little bit more about um, conflict situations and attractants uh, in thinking maybe about your own homes and properties and, and what might be an attractant for a coyote in your neighborhood. This is sort of like a typical backyard here with a number of things going on. So here might be Fluffy or, or Rover's dog food left outside, which would definitely be an attractant for a coyote or any other animal. Um, if you're feeding squirrels or other animals in your backyard, uh, then you definitely would have an attractant for coyotes, not so much the food, but actually the squirrels. Um, if you have a bird feeder uh, in your yard where the seed is uh, thrown out onto the ground, um, then that can be an attractant for coyotes because it usually means you've got rats um, coming in at night to eat the seed. And rats or other small rodents coming in to eat the seed from the bird feeder is again going to bring in a predator like a coyote. And then certainly um, garbage and compost is going to attract a wide range of animals to your yard. <clears throat> so, um, very important to understand, you know, when we, there is actually a problem with a coyote or whether it's just a matter of the, the level of tolerance that that person or, or that community has for a particular situation. Um, certainly we do get a lot of calls at Toronto Wildlife Centre about coyotes denning in places where people don't want them to den. Um, and everybody's reaction is completely different. Uh, if coyote is denning underneath someone's deck in their backyard, um, some people are delighted by that. They're fascinated. They have taken 7,000 photographs a day, you know, since day one. They're teaching their kids about it. The whole family and the community is involved, and they're learning about coyotes, and they consider it a really cool experience. But the next person's yard, that may be happening, and they're, they're absolutely terrified um, of the coyotes, and they do not want them to be there. Um, so certainly, you know, a person's um, perception of the situation or what they're willing to tolerate can be very, very different. And certainly people don't have to tolerate uh, coyotes denning in their yards or, or near um, their homes if they don't like that. Uh, coyotes do see people as predators, so there's a couple of really easy things that you can do to get coyotes to move on. For most coyotes, they're all individuals, so they all have different tolerance levels of us as well. Um, dirty old sweaty gym socks, chuck a bunch of those into the den. Um, or um, men, have a couple of beers and go and do your business uh, near the den site. That to the coyotes will be another predator scent marking around their den. And nine times out of 10 predators and predators like uh, coyotes and foxes will just pack up and move their babies somewhere else. Because they think that now you, big scary predator, is a threat to their babies. Women, you can do it too. It's a little more awkward. I guess it depends on how much privacy you have in your backyard, but. <clears throat> so certainly um, coyotes that are bold and uh, come across as aggressive and, and fearless towards people are almost without exception, again, related to food. Um, when people are feeding coyotes on a regular basis, it does, regularly, it does sort of sorry, dramatically change their behavior. It means that a coyote who originally would have been just scared out of his mind of people um, is now thinking, well, maybe people aren't so bad. You know, that person is giving me something yummy to eat every single day, you know, for the last month, and it's the dead of winter, and I'm freezing, and I'm having trouble finding food. And so their perspective of you changes a little bit, and they will come closer to you and your neighbors, you know, and other houses. And as I mentioned earlier, you're essentially training um, that coyote um, that it can trust people and it can come closer to people. If it stops getting that food or if it encounters a person who's not giving it the food, um, then it may uh, exhibit what may be perceived to be aggressive behavior uh, by that person in looking for food, coming too close, you know, almost coming near to nip the ankles like that one coyote in the park did um, because it's wondering why isn't it getting the food that it's been getting. And coyotes do have really complex relationships with dogs. Um, certainly little tiny dogs, as uh, the slide showed earlier, can potentially be a food item for coyotes. Uh, if you have a little tiny small dog, like Chihuahua, for example, um, and it is unsupervised, you know, outdoors, it is game for a lot of animals out there, uh, including coyotes to potentially eat. Um, you've probably heard about the, the Neville Park coyote in Toronto, maybe some of you have. There was a lot of media coverage about this coyote in Toronto. Um, and this coyote actually went over a fence into someone's yard and, uh, and grabbed a chihuahua right in the backyard. And um, this chihuahua, though, it 
came out um, over the, the following days and weeks was completely unsupervised. Uh, in this yard that was in a little ravine system where there was a known um, group of coyotes in that area. And there was also a lady about four or five doors down or so that was feeding the coyote uh, pretty much every day. She had been feeding the raccoons, which were another problem the neighbors were having, um, but she started feeding the coyote as well. So the coyote was coming right up to these backyards and then, you know, he's eating his normal snacks in the backyards. He sees a little chihuahua and it's so easy for him to get, grabs the chihuahua and off he goes. So. And then, of course, the world, you know, went crazy after that. But, you know, we were asked to get involved with that situation. Our rescue staff were really good at kept capturing wild animals. And we said, we're not going to capture that coyote. He didn't do anything that was unusual for a coyote to do. Um, but we do really need to stop the feeding of this coyote um, if, his, if we're going to make sure that his behavior actually doesn't continue to change. Um, with larger dogs, um, there, there are more complex relationships with coyotes. I mean, a coyote wouldn't see a large dog as a food item, um, unless, you know, he was desperate for food, but, I mean, that's, again, something that would happen very, very rarely. Um, coyotes are, are pretty afraid of a lot of large dogs, and a lot of the times when there are altercations between coyotes and large dogs, um, it's the dog that actually started um, the altercation most of the time um, when we do sort of our investigation and, and try to get at the facts that happen. Just recently, I was in a health food store in my neighborhood, and um, the lady there said, what am I going to do with the coyotes in, in our neighborhood? You know, I was walking my dog, you know, and a coyote attacked my dog. And I'm like, really? You know, what, what kind of dog do you have? And I think she said, like, bull mastiff or something. I'm like, really? <laughs> a coyote attacked, like, that size dog? She said, well, no, I guess the, my dog attacked the coyote. And that made complete sense to me, because now the coyote is defending itself. It's actually, you know, afraid for its life, probably, because this large canid, you know, wolf or bull mastiff, has gone after it now, and uh, it's, it's going to defend itself. And it can defend itself pretty well because it's a wild animal. Um, but most of the time with coyotes, um, if they have, for example, a, a strange coyote that comes into their territory, they don't have fights with them, typically. Um, their, their normal uh, kind of um, mode of behavior for a situation like that is to just warn them off with a series of vocalizations and, and posturing and just different ways that they actually um, position their body and they're basically giving them probably coyote profanity or I don't know what it is they're saying with their barking but basically just you know telling that, that, that coyote that this is their territory and there's almost never fights between strange coyotes like that. Um, when you have a coyote trying to do that with a bull mastiff or some other dog, that typically doesn't work very well. You know, they're not speaking the same language. And um, dogs, and I think we've all seen it happen, a lot of the times dogs just, they just go after whatever's moving, whether it be squirrels or rabbits or, or coyotes. And, uh, you know, again, the coyote is going to fight back. So the relationship becomes more complicated um, with large dogs and coyotes. So some of the very key messages that I think are important to sort of take away um, about coyotes is that um, they are very common uh, in urban areas, um, not just natural areas, but right in the middle of residential areas and industrial areas, as long as they're close to corridors. <coughs> they are very easily habituated to human food sources. So, I mean, human food sources just take so many different forms. They take the forms of our compost in our backyard, our garbage, our pets, unfortunately, um, actual food that we put out um, for our pets outdoors, intentional feeding of the coyotes. As I mentioned before, you know, just to remind you of all this, bird feeders, seed drops on the ground, rat comes in, food that's put out for the squirrels, basically anything um, that is either food directly for the coyote or food for animals, which the coyote then would consider food. Uh, can be a food attractant for a coyote that he would associate with people. <clears throat> there are lots and lots of coyotes living in our communities um, that are not habituated to people, that have not associated us with food um, that we're probably never going to see. Or we're only going to see a little tiny smooching of their tail, just hightailing it out of there, maybe one time, you know, in the entire time that coyote lives in the area. Um, but there's lots and lots of coyotes um, that do coexist in our neighborhoods without uh, ever um, causing problems or perceived problems for people uh, because they're doing completely what's normal for them. And the bottom line is they're not going anywhere. As I mentioned before, we've tried all kinds of nasty, mean, 
terrible things with coyotes to get rid of them over the last many hundreds and hundreds of years, and uh, we've done nothing to put a dent in their population. So as long as the habitat is appropriate for, for coyotes, there's enough food, water, and shelter for them, um, coyotes are, are always going to be in our neighborhoods. So dealing with uh, coyote conflicts, um, some of the, the approaches that you have, I guess, uh, to use, you know, as in, in your arsenal would be just simply tolerance of the situation, depending on what the situation is. Um, modifying human behavior, so things, an obvious one would be, as I've mentioned, uh, feeding or um, making sure that small animals are under control and not actually acting as a draw for coyotes. Um, preventative measures uh, as necessary, so um, things like putting up proper fencing uh, in your yard, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a minute. Um, now, legally, what you can do is, uh, if, if things escalate or if you want it to escalate, according to the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act, um, you can take certain actions to deal with problem wild animals on your, com on, on your properties. Um, you are responsible for wildlife situations on your own property, um, but in municipalities, uh, it is your actual uh, municipality who would be responsible for dealing with it as soon, as soon as the animal steps off your property and onto their property. Um, you are uh, allowed as a landowner under the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act to capture, kill, or harass uh, a wild animal uh, if you believe that it's going to damage your property or if it is damaging your property. Um, you are legally allowed to do that. Um, now, of course, at Toronto Wildlife Centre, it's not something that we generally recommend uh, because in 99% of the cases that, that we have experienced, it's not something that's actually going to be a solution to the problem. So, for example, if you've got a tiny little chihuahua, you know, and you're letting it out in your backyard unsupervised and you don't have a proper fence, to kill that coyote um, is going to be a very, very short-term solution because one of its family members is going to very quickly discover the unprotected chihuahuas in your yard or the next year the offspring of another coyote and uh, it, the problem will still persist unless you're actually getting at the root cause of, of what is actually creating the situation, and that would be either the, the fence or the unprotected small dog. <clears throat> so a little bit about live trapping and relocating. Um, under the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act, um, this is a, a possibility as long as their animals are not relocated basically outside of their home range. Um, so uh, for coyotes, uh, they are virtually impossible to trap and relocate. Um, rumor has it on the street that with a Neville Park coyote, the city of Toronto, who I hope is not here this evening to hear this, um, spent over $100,000 trying to catch that Neville Park coyote. That's a rumor, you know, they didn't tell me that, but through various sources, uh, that's what I have been told. Um, they hired trappers, they had their own staff out there, they had them sitting up in trees with nets, waiting for the coyote to come by and leap on the coyote. And uh, th this went on for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. They are very, very smart animals. They are incredibly wary of people. Um, they are one of the hardest animals to trap. Our rescue staff, who are really, really good at catching wildlife, they do that 365 days a year, have a really, really tough time uh, catching coyotes. So um, if you can actually manage to catch one, First of all, if you can give our rescue staff a call because they would love to get some pointers from you, <laughs> um, because it is really hard, uh, you have to release it within 24 hours, um, within one kilometer uh, if it's an adult, or within 15 kilometers if it's a young coyote. Um, that's what the law states. Uh, you cannot release it anywhere on private land without the permission of that landowner. And if it's a ginger orphan, it needs to go to a wildlife custodian. Um, if it is not um, moved, if you trap it and you don't want to move it somewhere, then your only other option is to kill it, basically to, to humanely kill it, um, which would, you know, in the case of someone in, in a Oakville, would mean probably taking it to a veterinarian and actually paying for that service. Um, <clears throat> so those are not usually options that people are really thrilled about. Um, I think that the perception is, is that we can, first of all, easily catch them, um, and then we can take them somewhere like our cottage, you know, or a nice field that we remember seeing in another city somewhere, um, and let them go there. Um, but besides it being illegal, it actually isn't a humane solution for the animal. Um, these are territorial animals, uh, so they will not be permitted to just happily stay uh, in another coyote's territory. And with a lot of wild animals, there are studies that show that, that there's a very, very high incidence of mortality. Now, I, I didn't 
see a study on coyotes particularly, but I know with raccoons, for, exa for example, 70% um, of raccoons that are trapped and relocated are dead in the first three months of being moved. Um, for things like being hit by cars because they're wandering around, um, so it isn't something that is typically a humane solution for them. Um, <clears throat> very, very important, of course, not to, to feed coyotes if you're trying to uh, reduce or prevent encounters with them. Now, this is a, actually a slide that is um, from another colleague of mine. It says you shouldn't approach coyotes, but I, I would say, you know, go ahead and approach them because, I mean, they're going to run away from you, you know, unless you happen to have a little coyote, uh, chihuahua in your arms or something. Um, but coyotes are really, really afraid of people. If you happen to have a, a coyote that approaches you, um, really all you need to do is act big and scary, wave your arms around, make loud noises, and you're very likely going to scare them off pretty fast. <clears throat> securing your garbage, um, as I've mentioned before, on your property is very, very important. So um, securing your garbage, um, making sure that what it's secured in, uh, not only can the coyote not get into the garbage, but small rodents can't get in so that they don't in turn attract coyotes. Um, and then something really basic that we always hear about is just putting the garbage out in the morning, uh, not the night before. And compost bins, very important to protect as well. <clears throat> and again, I'm re repeating some things here, but um, hopefully that means you'll remember it even more. So uh, things like um, feeders in your backyard. I mentioned before about the importance of, of feeders as an attractant because of the seed that's spilled and, and draws in things like rats. If you've got uh, fruit trees or berry trees or vegetable gardens in your backyard, it would be very important to make sure that there aren't little bits of food essentially lying all over the ground as an attractant for uh, coyotes or for rodents. Um, it is also important if you do have fruit and vegetable gardens to think about putting in uh, a good fence uh, in order to deter coyotes from actually coming into your yard. Um, now this fence here is actually a pretty decent fence for coyotes. It'd probably be better to be a little bit higher, but a solid wood fence is actually a good fence for them because they have great difficulty climbing it. Something like um, a fish pond in your backyard would also potentially be an attractant. Um, coyotes will sometimes actually eat the fish, um, but the water too would be an attractant for them as well. And then I mentioned about the pet food already. So just uh, a little bit more about um, your actual yards and deterrents in your yards. So you can use things like um, motion sensitive lighting, uh, which would work for a short amount of time uh, with coyotes and uh, other wild animals in your yard. Um, fencing your property in your yard, um, as I just mentioned in the last slide, the solid wood fencing is, is a great thing to use. Uh, this is chain link, and this is a coyote climbing the chain link. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen coyotes doing this, but they have no problem with chain link at all. They're like, oh, that's fun. It's like a jungle, jungle gym. They just go up one side and back down the other side. Foxes as well, they're excellent climbers. Um, this is actually uh, a wolf and coyote enclosure that we have. And these little buggers just spend 24 hours a day trying to get out. What you can't see here is there's actually a, a, climbing, a, a climbing barrier at the top. It's, three, it's angled in at a 45 degree angle and it actually comes into the enclosure. So as soon as they get up here, they can't actually get over because then they're on this really wobbly thing and they can't actually climb over the last little bit. Um, with coyotes too, it would also be important if you did have to use chain link or something like that to have a digging barrier um, at the bottom so they can't just dig underneath. So fencing in uh, your pets uh, is very important. If you can't fence in your entire yard, then if you're going to let a small dog outside, you could consider something like a dog run for them. Um, electric fencing, if you really want to go crazy, um, you can do that, uh, depending on the size of your property. And electric fencing doesn't have to be a, a huge thing. It can be something as simple as a, a single or a double strand of, of low voltage wire that goes around your property. This is something that's uh, not uncommon. Clearing away bushes and uh, plants, uh, which is where coyotes would find food like rats or small rodents, is something that may also keep uh, coyotes away from your property. And then, uh, as I touched on before, places like uh, decks, porches, and sheds um, that they might actually like to access for denning would also uh, be a good thing to look at on your property to see whether there's any spaces that they can get underneath uh, to create a den site for their young, unless that's something that you actually want, of course. So I think I don't have too, min too much longer to go. Um, certainly, um, again, with pets in your backyard, uh, you can uh, either go out with them, uh, make sure that they're on a short leash. Uh, you can do something like the dog run for dogs, um, but this is actually a, a cat enclosure. Um, and this is actually a corridor for a different type of cat enclosure, which is an option for cats too going outdoors so that the cats are safe as well as the wildlife safe from the cats. 
And just some last um, sort of quick facts about coyotes. Uh, they are crepuscular. Does anyone know what crepuscular means? It means that they're what? Crepuscular, yeah, evening as well as uh, dawn. So usually dawn and dusk. So coyotes in their natural state uh, are crepuscular and they prefer to be active and, and feeding and hunting at dawn and dusk. Um, they do really like edge habitat, um, so they do like, for example, if they're in a forested area and there's a field or an open space next to it, they do like to hunt right along that, that edge habitat. Um, as I mentioned before, coyotes usually live very close to or in corridors. Um, they don't like to live with wolves, and foxes don't like to live with coyotes. That's sort of the pecking order. Coyotes are very afraid of people, uh, despite what um, some might think. We work with them a lot at Toronto Wildlife Center. If we have to touch them for any reason, they're shaking, they're peeing down their back legs, they're really, really fearful of people. And uh, they may you know, appear kind of bold and, and confident when they're out there in their, own, um, in their own situation where they feel like they're more in control, but they certainly are very, very afraid of us. Um, coyotes uh, are suffering right now very terribly from sarcoptic mange, um, which is something that humans introduced to wolf, coyote, and fox populations, yay, in the early 1900s. Um, so this may change a coyote's behavior somewhat. If you see a coyote that looks sick, and if it may be sick with mange, um, that's a whole other story. It doesn't mean that the coyote is necessarily going to be dangerous to you, and in fact it won't be any more dangerous to you, um, but you may be seeing it a lot more. It may be lounging around your house a lot more, maybe lying in a driveway that's sunny because it's desperate to get the warmth from the pavement because it's got no fur left. Um, so its behavior may change quite a bit, and there are a lot of coyotes uh, in Oakville right now that have mange. As I mentioned before, what people usually describe as, as packs are usually family groups, and rabies is almost non-existent in coyotes. It is something that we hear about on a, a lot on our hotline. Uh, in places like Texas, it is an issue in coyotes, um, but in, in Ontario, coyotes are not considered a rabies vector species, so it is quite uncommon. There's some great um, resources available uh, because coyotes have been around for such a long time and uh, they're in all the major cities in North America. Los Angeles, you know, is having meetings just like this one, I'm sure, right now. Um, there's lots of great websites out there. Um, there's uh, some examples uh, right here of some websites where you can find coyote information. And I think uh, that Donna was going to make this information available on the town's website after uh, this evening. And just, I guess, some parting thoughts. If you, if you think that your um, situation with coyotes is, is a really, really big problem that you're grappling with, again, just to give uh, the situation a bit of perspective, um, just be thankful you don't live in Alberta. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalie. Despite that being a very comprehensive uh, presentation, I'm sure there are questions, but we have a panel for you so you can ask a variety of questions. And I would ask the, uh, the panelists to come now. At the far end, of course, those, if you arrived late, it's uh, Michael Howie from the Oakville Ta Today. He's a reporter with Oakville Today. We have Natalie from the Toronto Wildlife Center. We have Amanda Barrett at this end from the Oakville Milton Humane Society. And we have Chris Mark next to Amanda, who is the Director of Parks and Open Space for the Town of Oakville. The way we're going to do the questions, I have two assistants, uh, Suzanne and Tricia, will come around. So just put up your hand and uh, they'll come to you. Prefer if you use the microphone so everybody can hear your question. And if you would, we wouldn't mind, please introduce yourself. And I, if I could ask you to limit your question to a couple of minutes so, or three minutes so that we can get through all the questions in the time allotted to us tonight. And if you want to direct your question to somebody, please identify who you would like to direct it to. Otherwise, I will moderate and I'll, I'll listen to your question and direct it to the most appropriate person to answer. Um, the person with the microphone has the floor, so please don't interrupt them and please don't interrupt the response while that is happening. So who has a question? There must be questions here. Question at the back. Gentleman with the tie. Thanks very much for the presentation, and I, I totally support your view with coyotes, and I, I grew up in a rural Ontario, and the one thing I learned about coyotes, when you grow up in them, you don't see them. But I live in, uh, you know, against uh, a park area in Oakville, and I see a coyote many times, and they're very different from, because you see them. This one's there, you do aggressive behaviors towards it, it doesn't run away, so it's a very different kind of animal than I think what you were describing, and, and bigger. 
So just looking into this, um, so Brad, uh, Brent Peterson from the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources said, most coyotes that we're now seeing in eastern Ontario are wolf-coyote hybrids. And uh, Rowan Kate said, our results show the no northeastern coyote population is a hybrid swarm resulting from the widespread introgression of Great Lake wolves genes, resulting in a variation and adaptation for more efficient predation on deer. And he went on to describe the change in the animal much bigger, bigger jaw, bigger size uh, because of the change in predation. And then, um, uh, it was, oh yes, uh, Brad White from Trent University described the characteristics of the, he calls them coy wolves, that they hunt in packs. Uh, these are not animals that are hunting mice and squirrels and, and rabbits. They are, they are hunting uh, large animals, really sheep, cattle in broad daylight. And he was, they were purporting that it's the white-tailed deer population that's really brought this kind of genetic adaptation and change in. So I'm not sure what all that means. I just know that in my neighborhood there is a very large, I'm going to call it a koi wolf because it's, I think, uh, I think he said at the, the ones that are more wolf-like are about 80 pounds, so double the size of a coyote and around 40 pounds, and they are fearless in their, and they are very associated with humans. So I guess my question is, Everything, everything you've said I totally agree with about coyotes, but where you have this sort of coy wolf, and it's a large one, and it's become habituated to, to people, I'm wondering if there isn't a greater risk, uh, a risk to humans. And Parks Canada, sorry to do all this, but Parks Canada identified that there were, sorry, reported 60 unacceptable encounters since 2003, and most victims are five and under. So it's not, it's not so much what's happening in my backyard, it's not about my pet, it's about when I'm out with my five-year-old walking or if he's out, you know, tagging around, we, we have a trail. That Oakville's got fabulous trail systems, it's a wonderful place to live in and easy access to nature and that green environment is part of what makes our environment nice. And suddenly I, we have, I have uncertainty when I'm walking, I have a true uncertainty about this, my safety and certainly the safety of smaller children that are using those trail systems and are out and about in them. So specifically for a very large I'm going to call them a koi wolf, so I think that's really what we're dealing with, that's, that is very habituated and is fearless around humans, should we not have a more progressive uh, plan of action to deal with them? Great, thank you for that question. And uh, who can we get to answer that one? That's a very good one. Um, Thank you for the question. Um, certainly, I, I'm aware of the, the research that's going on right now into the, uh, the potential hybridization between uh, wolves and coyotes. And we've actually sent a number of samples ourselves from uh, wolves, actually, in particular to the, uh, the lab at uh, Trent University, although we're still waiting for them. It's been quite a long time. Um, and I've had a lot of discussions with Brent Patterson about this as well. Uh, certainly, the work that we have done some work with gray wolves, too. And uh, certainly our experience with gray wolves, um, in addition to coyotes, is that gray wolves are also, in their natural state, terrified of people. Because um, we didn't talk about wolves today, and I know that there's a, sort of this perception of the, the sort of the, the big bad wolf and the dangers that wolves pose to people. Uh, but again, the, the wolves that, that we were typically working with and all the wolf biologists that we spoke to um, certainly indicated that these are very animals that do not like to be around people. They're, they're, they're nervous of people. They like to just stay deep, deep in the brush. And in fact, the, the target wolves that we were after that were being captured because they were ill, we actually could only verify their existence through a series of uh, motion-activated cameras. So I think that the fact that an animal may be a hybrid coyote wolf doesn't uh, simply by definition means, mean that you have a more aggressive animal. However, uh, if that animal is larger as a result and has been habituated by, say, something like feeding, then I would certainly be potentially more concerned about that. Um, I know that in Toronto, I was, um, I was for certainly advocating quite strongly on behalf of there being a no-feeding bylaw uh, in Toronto for actually all wildlife, um, but in particular coyotes after we had a bunch of stuff going on with the high Park coyotes there. And uh, so I would, I would suggest that that would be a very good place to start um, for whether it be coyotes or koi wolves that are uh, exhibiting less fear of people is to just absolutely stamp out you know, the feeding of those animals uh, in any way that we possibly can uh, if there may be an increased potential risk to people. 
Um, I think no, another part of the question was uh, what happens if you run across a, a wolf or, or a coyote on a trail? Um, yeah, I haven't really covered it in the presentation. So what is the reaction you should have if you meet up with a coyote on a trail? Yeah, and I, they did mention that briefly in the presentation, but we're, what works 99% you know, of the time with these animals is, again, just looking big and bold and mean, waving your arms around, making noise, stamping up and down, you know, throwing things at it. Usually, by the time you've done one of those things with a normal uh, coyote, they're gone. Um, so for, for most animals, um, that should be enough to get them away uh, from a person. If there is a, a coyote that is truly not backing down uh, in a situation like that, again, I would consider that to be a very, very unusual animal. And that would be something that I would suggest uh, would have to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis with perhaps the local um, animal control department. But it isn't something that would be typical for all coyotes or even all coyote wolf crosses in an area. Thank you, Natalie. Next question. Any other questions? In the front row here. Um, Tricia will help okay. come to the mic. With Hi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alan Elger, and I'm a counselor in, in Glen Abbey, Ward 4. And the issue is um, nobody's saying they don't like coyotes, but it's exactly what you are saying. We, there seems to be a, an area where there is a coyote which doesn't seem to be afraid of people in the evening. And I think people, parents are concerned. They've got three and four year old uh, children. And if the coyote doesn't seem to get spooked and go away, I, like nobody wants to see something happen to a child. And like, I'm just wondering what we can do to make sure that a child's life is not threatened. And should we do something with a particular coyote or will another one come in and be just as bad? But it seems there are a few that are not uh, human uh, fearing uh, at all. Thanks, Alan. Um, this is the coyote that I've gotten most of my phone calls about and I've written about on several occasions. Um, it's also, uh, I believe it might be the one that's injured that uh, the Humane Society's been taking a look for. I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, one of the really key things here is the use of words. As silly as it sounds when we're talking about a coyote, um, is it habituated? Is it not afraid of people? Or is it 30 feet away and you're not doing anything that should scare it? Um, my impression is that this coyote has lived in Glen Abbey most of its life and has seen people every day and had no reason to fear them. Uh, while it doesn't want to get up and snuggle with you or anybody else in this room, uh, from across the street, it's going to look at you. It's going to watch you and see what you're doing. You're going to make a bunch of noise. Um, we have been trained to respond to car horns, but does a bunny respond to it? No, because it means nothing. So it's, it's trying to look at this from a slightly different perspective. It's trying to consider how we describe it. Um, I've had stories uh, uh, about a coyote doing this, standing there looking at a gentleman. Uh, there was one a few weeks ago in the paper. The, the other paper also covered it. And the whole thing was, this coyote looked at me, I yelled at it, I shouted at it, and it didn't run away. But what did it do? It stood there, it watched him for a minute, and then it left. It wasn't bold. It simply wasn't immediately frightened by a sound that it's, in my opinion, very likely familiarized with. Um, <clears throat> I think something we could look at doing is some hazing, which has been very effective at Weston Stanley Park. That's very commonly where you just go a little further in that making loud noises. Um, and I'm not the one to talk about that, but I think it is something to look at if this is a real concern for people. Uh, as for it abducting small children out of the backyard, um, I can't speak to that. I don't know what will happen, and I'm not going to say nothing bad could ever happen. But I can talk about local stats. In Oakville specifically, and I had these pulled from the region, there are over 100 dog bites. There has been no coyote bites. There has been no coyote scratches. Um, if you look at the crime stats in Glen Abbey, it's the same thing. There's significant crime in the area that's going to affect most people, but the coyotes have not. Uh, it's perspective again. It's the use of what words we're using to describe this stuff that we're seeing. So I think it's trying to prevent ourselves from getting overreacting to a situation that may not be as drastic as it seems to be on the surface. And also the game of telephone amongst the community members, uh, which you are very familiar with, I know. Um, 
and that's one person sees this and tells another person who tells another person who tells another person, and before you know it, it's someone being chased through the park by a rabid coyote, which I believe was, I actually heard a call about that on a police scanner, that a rabid coyote had people cornered in a park. That actually was, someone called 911 for that. And when I, I, I spoke with um, Humane Society and I spoke with everyone else, and a coyote showed up at the edge of the forest where kids were playing on the other side of the soccer field, it looked at them for a minute and it turned around and went back into the forest. But someone driving by called that in and said there's a rabid coyote chasing children and cornering them. So I, I might ask if uh, the town of Oakville or the uh, Humane Society has anything to respond to that question as well. Do, Chris, do you have anything to add to, from the town of Oakville? Just, it's on. Yep. Um, certainly from the town's perspective, we've been, uh, over the years, coyotes, again, are not, are not new to Oakville, as people have mentioned tonight. Uh, in fact, I think one of the first public meetings that I had um, when I started with the town in 1995 was actually on coyotes. So they've been around for a long time, and as, um, as, as Natalie mentioned, they are here to stay. And um, we've been trying to, you know, educate the, the public about coyotes and really trying to coexist with, with coyotes over the last number of years. Uh, we're not coyote experts at the town. We're, um, we certainly rely on uh, people within the MNR. Uh, Natalie, who's here with us tonight, and of course our, um, our friends at the Humane Society. So uh, we do get uh, a large number of, of calls about coyotes. Um, our, our main thrust in terms of our communication has, has always tried to be in terms of uh, having people keep their, uh, their pets uh, on leash within their backyard and not letting them loose within their backyard. And one of the other constant um, issues that I see out there on a regular basis, because uh, we have over 200 kilometers of trail, and I certainly I think I've walked every kilometer of it and do that on a regular basis, is uh, composters that people put actually out within the trail system. Uh, people all want to have their composter, but for some reason they don't want to have it within their backyard. So a large number of people put them over the fence uh, within, the, within the park space, um, which is really an attractant uh, for the coyotes and other, other wildlife. So um, that's you know, just one thing that, that we try to tell people all the time is that um, as much as you think you're, 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 you know, you're, you're being good by recycling and composting, in fact, you're, you're, you're hurting uh, the neighborhood by having these uh, composters out in the actual wildlife corridor. And I call them wildlife corridors because that's actually what they are. And we are blessed to have these um, natural valley systems in Oakville. Uh, in fact, so much so that we now have the natural heritage system in, uh, in North Oakville, which is a, a wonderful area, uh, which we're keeping in perpetuity. But part of that and keeping with that is it's gonna be a wildlife corridor as well. So um, coyotes are, are definitely here to stay uh, and our our main thrust has been to simply try and educate people for uh, coexisting with them. Thank you. Do you have anything to add to that, or you're, you're basically uh, our position again is is uh, ultimately is to help provide you the information to prevent any uh, any wildlife coming into your home. But all we can do is provide the preventive measures that we receive from great organizations like Natalie's. Um, but our ultimate goal is to help the animal when it's sick and injured and also help you when we see an animal sick and injured. But uh, again, that's, that's where we unfortunately get involved. We will take your calls. We will direct you uh, to who to call. Uh, we'll provide you as much information as we can to protect yourselves and your community. But again, uh, unfortunately, our mandate is uh, towards the sick and the injured, so. Thank you, Amanda. Next question. At the back, there's a question. Just wait for the microphone so everybody can hear the question. Um, yes, uh, I have two suggestions. Number one, if, the, uh, uh, if there are a number of sightings in a particular area, then uh, the town could always buy some trail cameras to see what movement of wildlife there is in that area. That's a suggestion number one. That may not be feasible because the number of people who use the trail, however. The, the second suggestion I have is that if you are concerned about coyotes and putting your out for a walk, for God's sake, take a whistle with you. Okay? 
take a whistle, use the whistle. If it doesn't scare the coyote, at least it will bring help from the neighbors. Thank you for those comments and suggestions. That's great. Next question. Is, if I could ask you if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself uh, before you ask your question or pose your comment. Hi, I'm uh, Jillian Manchester. Our family moved to Oakville in the 1960s and lived around Lawson Park, so Diana Avenue, Morrison area. So we've had lots of experience with the wildlife and um, even having cats and dogs. We've had foxes come through the yard. We've had coyotes. We've had, and none of them have ever bothered the pets. They haven't killed the pets. They haven't. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, one evening about eight years ago, I was walking my mom's West Highland Terrier around 11 o'clock at night in that neighborhood. And I always walk with a, a walking stick as well as the leash. And Hamish suddenly sat down, and this is a dog, the little West Highland Terrier, that would bark if there was an Alsatian or German Shepherd within two blocks, would bark and bark and bark and wouldn't stop. So absolutely hates German Shepherds. But he sat down, and this was, you know, a dark night starlit, sat down, and a coyote came across, and the coyote touched his nose to Hamish's nose. They looked at each other, and the coyote just continued on. You know, when I saw the coyote coming, I thought, well, you know, I was ready in case I had to do something. But it really wasn't that alarming because the wildlife has been around for, for some time. And I think a sure indicator was that this dog that generally would bark at, you know, most dangerous, what it would consider a dangerous animal, didn't bark at all. In fact, just sat and, and looked at it. So, you know, we're used to, our families used to having the wildlife in the neighborhood. I now live up in Glen Abbey, and I've seen a coyote crossing. But generally, like when I watch it crossing, if there are people, it will sort of go around. It'll take a, a distant route around. You know, it'll note what's there. And it'll sometimes cross the, the road. And it's in the, you know, around the soccer field at the back. But quite frankly, I have more problems with five raccoons pooping on my back deck than I do with the coyotes or, you know, foxes. Uh, there was a woman on Diane Avenue that, this is ages ago, back in the early 60s and 70s, and she thought it was cute to feed the fox. There was a, a vixen that was standing in her backyard, and she was feeding the fox candy. Well, that became a problem, because after that, the fox were looking to people for candy. So you're absolutely right. It's, you know, if people are trained not to feed these animals, they'll mind their own business, is my opinion. And, you know, not that I'm an expert other than having lived in Oakville for this length of time. And, you know, from a family of seven, no one ever having a run in with them, even though the animals are in our neighborhood. There was um, an owl one time that hunted. Mum let her cat out once that was declawed. She didn't have it declawed, but, um, and there was an owl at night that, that got that cat. But, so the owl was a little more dangerous than, you know, uh, the coyotes or, or the fox, quite frankly. So, well, thank you for your... So I'm not sure that that's reassuring to anyone. But I, and, and quite frankly, I think, you know, four, three, five-year-olds, I'd be more concerned about, excuse me, but perverts in the neighborhood than a coyote passing by. The parents need to be there where their children are or have the area supervised. And I think if you have an adult with a child, the situation's handled. That's my opinion. Thank you for your comment and your story. That was interesting. The next question. There's a question over on this side here, it's back here. And every time I go for a hike, I always take a hiking stick, and I always take a Fox 40 whistle with me, just in case I ever got injured or anything. And the Fox 40 whistle is the type that doesn't have a pee in it, and it will blow every time. It will blow even if it's absolutely underwater or wet. So uh, you know, that, stick that in your pocket and take a walking stick just as precautions. So question over here, just introduce yourself, please. Hi, uh, Rita Kasasha. First of all, I'd just like to thank you for reassuring me because I saw a coyote and I was so fearful. But I think now I understand I don't have to be afraid when I'm walking my dog. I was right. really petrified. Okay. Thank you. That, that's what it is. It's education, right? And it's a... Secondly, is it possible to get some um, signs erected at their West Oak Trails Park, like a metal sign, warning of coyotes? Because uh, I know down in Mississauga they have... Um, J.C. Sannington Park, they do have a metal sign informing people about coyotes coming out at night, at mm -hmm. dusk. Is it possible at West Oak Trails? Because I did see a coyote there. And I have my dog, and I do see people having their dogs off leash, and I tell them there's coyotes in the bush there. Right. 
Uh, Chris. Um, certainly we've, we've thought about putting up signage, but really it, it would almost have to be town-wide because we do have coyote sightings that are on a town-wide basis, but um, I do hear what you're saying. I think West Oak Trails Park is sort of a, a bit of a hot spot right now, as is uh, Windrush Park uh, in Glen Abbey as well. So um, we'll certainly take that into consideration. And while we don't have any um, coyote signs presently, it's certainly they're easy to get made up and we can get those installed. So uh, I appreciate that suggestion coming forward. Question over here. It's, uh, can you just introduce Helmut, yourself, please? Helmut Erksleven and uh, we back onto the big pond, and coyotes love the animals there. I just want to add a suggestion to what people have said. Because um, I'm retired, I happen to walk, take a go for walks during the day. And um, oh, not too long ago, I heard the coyotes at night, and I saw one slipping into the bush. Next morning, there was a nanny taking these little kids for a walk, and. Uh, little three, four-year-old was walking directly, you know, within 10 feet of where I thought the curator was. So the suggestion with the whistle, if you have a nanny, make sure she takes the whistle along and maybe keep a good eye out. Uh, I think we've got, the people who are getting the information may not be the ones who really need it. Yeah. So, and this is an affluent society, and our, our grandkids have had nannies, and they don't always know everything about everything. Yep, so the more information that can be provided on the websites with your fact sheets, the better it is, so that's great. Let's go back over to this side, or there's some down in the middle there. There's one right in front here, we'll go up front, and then we'll come to the back, we'll come to you next. Yeah. Hi, my name's Christine Bell, and I have, um, I guess, a question and a comment. Um, I walk in the woods a lot with my dogs, and never have seen a coyote ever, but I notice that there's a lot of broken beer bottles and Tim Hortons cups mm -hmm. and all kinds of crap. And so I guess my comment is for all the nature lovers out there, um, it'd be really helpful if there was a way that Oakville could remind people that this is nature and coyotes are part of nature and they have as much right to be there as we do. And how do we educate people to educate their children not to go into the forest and burn fires and burn bridges and leave all kinds of stuff in there that's not only dangerous to the people who care about their kids but to the animals and other people that are walking around and how can we address that because I come across that every single day. That's a good point. Uh, Natalie, do you want to, any, any thoughts on that Natalie? From what you've seen happen around uh, GTA? Education, neighborhood and education programs or anything like that? You know, other than seminars like this and websites and fact sheets. Has there been any programs that you've heard of in your 20 years? I think this is probably more a municipal issue, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> because uh, it isn't something that we're usually directly involved in, is sort of uh, parks issues, you know, yeah. except as it comes to, you know, directly related to wildlife issues in parks. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are uh, the, some of the websites I put up towards the end uh, about some great programs uh, with coyotes. Um, one of them is in Stanley Park and uh, out in BC, and they've got some, they've done some fantastic work with coyotes in Stanley Park out there with respect to signage and things like that. Right. But I, d I don't think that necessarily directly relates to the other part of what you're asking about, um, which frustrates me all the time is, you know, things like broken glass, you know, in, in the parks, which I think is uh, incredibly dangerous. Well, I guess, but it, I guess Yeah. Good point. Absolutely, I think it's a great point. Yep. Thank you. Uh, back in the middle here, please. Um, Trisha. Trisha will come to you with the mic. Introduce yourself, oh, please. Perfect. Hi, my, my name is Huda, and this is more of just a comment than anything okay. else. But I'm out fairly early every morning with my dog, and I have seeing coyotes in the morning. And what part of the town? Uh, Braze Lane. Braze Lane area, so yeah. Heritage Way. And I've, every time I run into one, they pretty much just back away. They don't. Yeah. I've never had an issue with one. But I, what I do have an issue with is, you know, we have uh, licensing, I think, here now in Oakville for cats. Uh, right? And I've seen many cats running around. I've called. 
and nothing seems to get done. So if my cat's run, my dog's running around, you know, off leash, I'm going to get a ticket. And she's licensed and everything, but I'll get a ticket. But somebody with a cat, you know, I call constantly and nothing happens. And, I, you know, I've had a neighbor just recently lose their cat to a coyote. And, uh, you know, he was letting it run out all the time and it was bound to happen. We're right yeah. on a trail. So, you know, and I agree with the lady over there about all the broken glass. There's a big problem. And I'll go with that. The garbage in the trails, yeah. Yeah, and do the want, Do you want to say anything about that, Amanda? Is there, Amanda can talk to the uh, cat issue. Um, with the, uh, the cat bylaw that is uh, actually surfaced just the beginning of this year for roaming at large, it is something that obviously is going to be a, uh, a work in progress. Um, unfortunately, with cats versus dogs, usually with dogs, there is an owner attached there somewhere. With cats roaming at large, large, there's not. And then we need to try and figure out where those cats belong to. Try and catch a cat. It's as about the same as trying to catch a coyote, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> um, we don't go and hide behind trees. We're not like that cartoon that you see <laughs> with our big nets. <laughs> Okay, again, I, I would like to speak to you after because I can't speak on a case that I'm not aware of without uh, some information, but definitely I do have some business cards. I am the manager of the department. And I would definitely like to speak to you in regards to the concern there because, again, we do like to say that we're very proactive in trying to uh, educate people why keeping your pets supervised under care and control is a benefit not only for your animals, a benefit for yourself, and a benefit for, for your community that you're in. So again, I would like to speak with you about that after. Next question, right up front, there's a question here. The gentleman in the blue jacket, and there's another one next back there. Blonde lady at the back. You first, yes. Okay, my name is Gunter Hartlib. I just want to make sure I understand the law properly as it was stated there, that a uh, landowner is responsible for managing, managing the wildlife on his property. So if there's a situation where a coyote or a raccoon or any, any other kind of wildlife is about to attack my dog, my cat, my child in my yard. I have the right to kill this animal? No, I just want to rectify that uh, or uh, make sure I understand that for future discussions. Not that I want to kill the animal, but is that the way it is, the law is written? We'll let Natalie start and then Amanda might add in some things on the end there. Uh, according to the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act, uh, because there's all different types of laws you have to consider, of course, uh, yes, that is the case. Uh, in protection of your property, and um, I'm not sure if property means your children, but I'm sure that they would include that. Uh, certainly, if there's a, a risk that your property is going to be damaged, or there's actually damage occurring, or there's some kind of danger, you are authorized under the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act to, um, to kill that animal. Um, you do have to kill it humanely. Um, but certainly there are other laws that you need to follow as far as your, just your town goes. Like, for example, if you had a, a no firearms discharge, you know, you couldn't pull out a gun and, and you know, do that. So um, certainly you're limited in the manner in which you can uh, humanely kill an animal. Just a sec. We'll just bring the mic over so everybody can hear the rest there. A few years ago, there was an, an incident down in Toronto where a guy got caught on a surveillance camera trying to drown a raccoon. He, had a, he trapped it, put it in a cage, and stuck it into the icy water of Lake Ontario. Surveillance camera caught him, pulling the animal out, was still alive, so he wasn't satisfied, stuck the thing back in there again until it was frozen to death, and then he pulled it out. Little did he know that he was caught on camera. The fine in Toronto, I understand, is $5,000. Now, what happened to the guy, or why he trapped the animal and killed it, that was not, nobody talked about that. But maybe there was a possibility that the animal was doing damage to his house, and he trapped it, and then he wanted to kill it in Lake Ontario. Not exactly a nice way of going, but uh, in a situation like that, it is justified to do that, if, if the animal did damage to his house. If the animal is humanely euthanized or humanely killed, you, drowning is not considered, uh, no, according to veterinary standards, a, a, an acceptable humane form of, of killing an animal, no. 
So I mean that I mean I'm not familiar. I, I vaguely remember it, but I think that that would have actually fallen more under the cruelty legislation, which is federal law in Canada. So we'll go back over to this side for questions. There's a, a blonde lady at the back who has a question, and then there's a gentleman up here who has a question. So we'll, we'll get to everybody. We have about 20 minutes left. Hi. I'm Joanne. Time. I live in the Glen Abbey area. I've lived there 10 years. And first of all, I want to address the lady's concern about the beer bottles and garbage in the trails. There's a program called Adopt a Trail in Oakville that I'm also a part of, and I actually go to the trails and clean that up once a week and pick up the garbage and everything else. Fantastic. So if you'd like to participate, you can certainly call the city to do that. Thank you. As for the coyotes, I don't believe they're really the coyotes that I've seen in the pictures. I think they are more like the co koi wolves that I've seen. And I've had several encounters, and they've never been like charging at me or anything as such. But what I'm concerned about is with all the new development north of us, it's really caused more to come to our areas than our trails. And without any natural predators, what are we doing to control the proliferation? That's my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that question. Hi. Um, I, I have a couple points on that one. One is the, uh, the control of the proliferation of the population. That's done naturally. Uh, it always has been for every species. If it gets too abundant, the food source dries up, the species dies out. It's not pretty, it's not friendly, but that's what happens. They starve to death, they freeze to death. Um, as for the, the growth, what's actually interesting, I looked into this very specifically in Glen Abbey. Um, yes, there's been a lot of growth in that northern area, which has pushed them further down into the heritage, uh, heritage trails. No, is that right, Alan? Okay, it's good enough. Um, but what's happened in the last year and a half or two years is a vast amount of development between third line and fourth line on the North Service Road. All of that was relatively tall, untouched grass that led onto a trail system. And we've put in two or three car dealerships, public storage facility, two new office towers. All of that was prime hunting land for the coyotes. So now they're crossing the street, pretty much, is what people are seeing, I think. Um, uh, I really briefly wanted to touch on the koi wolf thing that came up earlier, too. Um, two points. One... My understanding from natural history that I've learned is that the coyotes we have here are actually western coyotes that bred with eastern wolves well over a hundred years ago. So most DNA testing will show a mix of some kind. Um, as, as you saw in uh, one of the presentations, uh, they came here uh, in the 19th century. So they've been here a while. Um, and as for the koi wolf uh, consideration, I couldn't tell you the difference between a husky, a koi wolf, and a wolf if I saw them. And I spent a lot of time looking at them. Um, and that sounds kind of blunt and rude, but frankly, that needs to be considered. There's, I think, maybe two or three people in this room qualified to be able to eyeball what a species is specifically at that kind of uh, level. And that just needs to be kept in mind. Um, while it's, it's nice to say that looks big from a distance, what is big? If you spent your entire life around Yorkies, coyotes going to look huge. I've got 160 pounds of mutt waiting at home for me. They don't look that big to me. You know, it's, it's all a matter of perspective in that regard. Thank you, Michael. Let's go to the next question. Question on this side, right in, this, right in the center there. And there's another one over here after. Just introduce yourself, please. I'm Tony Partington. I'm from the Ravine Gate uh, development, um, just up at uh, Third Line and uh, Upper Middle. Um, a, a, a point of observation is that uh, one of our residents has taken a, quite a number of lovely pictures of the coyote uh, going by our development. Um, my belief is that it, it comes by because it knows that we can't jump the fence that we're in. We're actually the caged animals to it. <laughs> and it knows that the dog can't clear it. Right. At the same time, you know, we've heard residents uh, you know, uh, tell stories that they've come in late at night driving in and they've caught the coyote on our side of the fence yep. and it easily clears the fence. Uh -huh. And it's about hip height, yes. waist height. How high does a how high, how athletic, I guess, is a coyote? And then the second question is really a reverse behavioral question regarding dogs. 
because our residents have a lot of very small dogs and they used to enjoy taking them for walks on the trails that actually run right through our development. But the dogs uh, and small dogs go after big dogs all the time. They really show how macho they are. But the small dogs, when they go onto the trails, are scared. And they don't like being on the trail now. And we're taking our dogs walking through the developed subdivisions. Is there any sort of way of, of changing the psychology of some of the small dogs to make them feel comfortable? You know, they seem to sense that there's coyotes out there and they're meat on the table and they won't go into the areas where it's dense. So is there a behavioral specialist out there? Uh, you know? We may not be able to answer the second question, but uh, we'll, we'll try. I, I've the, never the, had a dog. The, the first question, I think, uh, well, high is, how high is the high jump bar for, uh, for coyotes? And you talked about the fence, that they can climb a fence and as long as there's no sort of a barrier at the top. but. I'm sure the, the height is pretty high too, the where they could jump over. Yeah, and you know, I don't actually know what the exact height is. I mean, certainly the where you put your hand there, I, I would be absolutely unsurprised if a coyote could jump that, but I don't know what the exact height is. And I'm sure that like deer depends too on um, how much encouragement that they have to jump something. I mean, certainly a deer can jump a nine foot fence when it's just out grazing and meandering around, it doesn't usually jump over a nine foot fence. Usually they do that if they're being chased by something. So I, I don't think I could answer that question exactly. Uh, oh. if, you have a, if you have a farm and you're fencing for coyotes to keep them out, they say if you have an electric fence that they can, you have to have the top wire at five and a half feet. They can clear it. They could clear anything below five and a half feet. Thank, Thank you, you. Alan. And the behavioral question? Let's see if uh, we get some sort of answer. Not that I'm a dog behavioralist nor a psychologist, <laughs> but it, it's, it's like anything. They read us. If we're showing fear, our dogs are going to show fear. So they're reading off of you as well. So it's more likely that you're probably afraid of walking those trails than the dog itself. Um, it's like a, a dog that doesn't know what water is. And, and you're scared for him and you're trying to put that dog into the water, the dog's gonna read off of your fears more than anything. Um, one of the best things that we've actually been taught by a lot of organizations for a, a preventative is not even just a walking stick, an umbrella. Something that everybody carries. The sound of the umbrella is something different that they haven't heard. Opening the umbrella and making it as big as you can is a great deterrent. And it's, it's something that's, that's readily available to everybody. Um, but going back to the dog psychology thing, again, I think it's more that he's reading off of, of, of human uh, behavior more than anything. So we have time for about four more questions. Who has questions still? There's one here. Any other questions out there? So this will be our last question. Then. Um, this isn't a question. I yep. was uh, on the trail behind, I can't, exp I don't actually know the name of the trail. You go up over the QE on third line and go behind the townhouses and go up to upper middle. And I was running there last year, and it was the week after the dog attack, I don't know, whatever. And as I was running, I thought, oh great. There it was sitting on the trail, looking at me, it did not move. I'm alone on the trail, and I'm not five and a half feet tall. It could easily take me. And I'm thinking, I don't feel safe. And I should feel safe on my own trails in Oakville. And I'd like to know what you think a whistle's gonna do for me on a trail where no one's going to hear me. And now you say they're not gonna attack. You do it. You do it alone and tell me you're feeling safe. And if that coyote anywhere in Oakville does anything to any child, then everybody will be in a flap. But until then, nothing's done. And not that I expect you to change things, and I understand where you're coming from, and I don't want them hurt, and I get the idea. But I don't feel safe, and those trails were built for us to use. And I don't know what you expect, and I can't run with an umbrella or a stick or a bottle of mace. I've looked at it all and tried it. So what, I have a bell I wear, so it jingles so they hear me coming. I see other people on occasion. I do not go at dusk or dawn, and I, that's when it was sitting looking at me. I backed up, went around, told people I saw there's a coyote on the trail, walk, like out there, not looking threatened. And I know what you've said, but can you guarantee me? I'd like to take a to uh, I'd like to, to address that. And it's not from my expert you know, panel's perspective, it's from my personal perspective. I have been walking in, the na in nature twice where I have been afraid for my life. Twice. And it was from an animal. And 
in both circumstances, because I've got some biology, I knew that I had to be calm, I had to react, I had to think about what the best thing to do was. In one case, I was defending my two-year-old son. In another, I'm sorry for engineers, I was defending a water resources engineer who was afraid of the animal. In both circumstances, it was successful, but I put myself all five feet of me, and I was younger and smaller, but I put myself between the animal and whoever's behind me. Both cases, they were big dogs off, not fleash. So I would be more afraid of a dog off leash than a natural environment, or sorry, a natural predator who wasn't acclimatized to dealing and being aggressive towards, towards people. So whether it's a coyote or a dog, both circumstances worked. I, def I defended my two-year-old son. So, I mean, okay, this is where you're getting very personal and emotional, so am I. I was emotional, but I did what was the best thing to do and, and it worked. So you get that reaction. I was big, bold, and loud, and it worked. One was two German shepherds on an open beach that was deserted. So this is what will work, and I think that we're providing you a lot of advice on how you can react, and you know we're looking at signage, we're looking at how to educate you to deal with those types of situations. So. A German Shepherd, and I've, I've had incidences, and they're okay because they're a dog. No, but they're not okay. I know what you mean. But I can read a dog. I don't read a wild animal when it sits smugly on the trail in front of me as if, oh, here she comes. Oh, well, let's just see if she's going to pass me. I, it probably took off. But the feeling in my heart and the moment when I'm thinking I'm on a trail where there's nobody, if anything happened to me or anybody else, I'm not that big of a person. Like I, it's just, uh, yes, it's fear. You're thinking, oh, she did. But try it. Be me and be alone and don't even have a dog with you and have a whistle and see how effective it is. I'd scared. like to uh, comment on that from a trying to not be emotional uh, response with it. Uh, I'm going to give you one after, though. But the, first, the, the facts. On that trail system, you are more likely to be raped, murdered, abducted, uh, sexually assaulted, uh, robbed, beaten up, your husband is more likely to follow you and beat you up there than you are to have a negative encounter with a coyote. And those, that happens in Oakville every day. Um, that is reality, as harsh as it sounds. Bad things can happen, and they do happen. And what we can do is try to prepare ourselves for certain things to happen. We can rely on people to help us understand what things can happen. Uh, there is no answer to your question. There is no guarantee. I could sit here right now and frankly a car could come rushing through that door, miss everybody else and hit me. I've actually seen that happen in Oakville. I saw a dump truck go through eight cars and not hurt anybody. I've also seen a dump truck bing someone and she died on the spot. No one can provide you with that kind of answer. That's a reality. On a more emotional level, I've lived my entire life with generalized anxiety disorder. My entire life has been ruled by fear. The fact that I'm sitting here right now is nothing short of pharmaceutical miracles. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm serious. I, with you and me. Uh, fear is the most frightening thing. It, it, being afraid there is nothing worse in the world. And I can understand that. And you say, a small woman, I'm a big guy. There's not a lot of things that can move me around. But I know fear that would knock your socks off. Um, and it debilitates me physically. And the only way to get past fear in any case is to look at it and deal with it. I can sit here, as I said, and I could be shot um, I actually have an intern start my car after I write certain crime stories. Um, he's on vacation right now, so I have a freelancer here. She's not going to start my car because I don't pay her enough. But that, I've actually done that. I've written about deadly diseases. Um, I, there's no answer. That's the problem to a question like that. It's a moral, philosophical question. 
It's if a tree falls in a forest. Um, and I think that's something is, as hard as it is to, to have to say is there, no one can totally reassure you of that. If that's what you truly fear, don't run on the trails. Uh, that's the reality. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're more likely to be hit by a cyclist on the trail than you are by a coyote. <laughs> more likely, as I said, that's... Um, Thank you. That run with a partner, I was just told. And if you come up across a, a coyote, don't run because they'll think that's a natural, natural predator thing and chase you. So you're doing the right things. You're educating yourself. You're here tonight, and that's the goal of tonight is to talk about this. Let's educate ourselves. Wearing a bell is a very good idea so that they can hear you coming and uh, potentially take off. And you probably don't see any coyotes very often because you do wear a bell. And a bell is a very good thing in any wildlife trails for bears and for coyotes or whatever might be out there. So um, educating ourselves, um, making sure we know how to react if we do come across one and standing tall, standing big, don't run. Those are all the sort of messages that are, are being delivered and that's the best we can do. Some signage at the trails has been discussed with the town and some more education on the website. Uh, there's some excellent websites out there and uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank everybody for coming tonight. and. Uh, and there is additional information on the table outside if you didn't pick up some on the way in. And uh, thank you for coming, and that's the end of the evening. Uh, there is enough. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure everybody knew the upcoming speaker series, uh, Living with Canada Geese, or not living with them. Winter of 2012 is coming up, and Wildlife Proofing Your Home, Spring of 2012 and getting to know your wild neighbors in the summer 2012. So a continuing education series about living with wildlife. There's a lot of wildlife corridors from the north and Greenbelt and at Glen Abbey that leads right into Oakville. So you're going to be living with wildlife forever in your backyards and in your neighborhoods and let's learn to live with them. Thank you. <laughs>